You are now tuned into the Leader's Lens Podcast. I just think you're doing, I'm just going to start talking to you about your cohort as people are coming in, Erica, mm-hmm. because your, your cohort is incredible. 28 five-star reviews to get us started. And I appreciate everybody for joining us on the first ever Leader's Lens virtual event. And what's going to help us out is going to is a lot of engagement. So if you're hearing something that you like, leaving comments in the chat are going to help us out a ton. We'll go over this again as we get started. But to get started, we have a question on the bottom. And that question is, what is one song that pumps you up before a workout session? So if you could leave a comment, if you have a couple of brave souls that want to come off mute and join the conversation, that would be also exciting. But what is one song that pumps you up before a workout session? Erica, what is that song for you? Oh, it's so embarrassing. I just I just said this in private, so I have to say it again. Um, it's literally a very unknown Backstreet Boys song, I think from a couple of years ago called okay. Let It Be. Let it be. I'm Let adding it, it to my be. playlist. It's a I bad work- song, but like it gets me going when I'm working. I will not listen to it unless I'm working out because it's that into that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not your favorite, but it just gets it, it makes it work. My uh my workout is list is mostly hip hop, so I need to I need to mix it up a little bit more. I need some variety in my life. We got some good answers in the chat here. So start me up, classic, the legendary workout track. Lose yourself was another big one for sure. Mm-hmm. Eye of the Tiger, yes. I feel like that's just like a timeless, timeless workout song, though, Michelle. So I think you're good to go there. I'm good. I don't think I know that song, but David Gooda, I'll have to check it out. I, I, pro- I bet it's one of those songs that when I hear it, I'll recognize it right away. I just don't know the name of it. Mm. Workout by Jake Coles. That's a good one. That one of your favorites? That's a good one. I can't pick a favorite. Well, Lorena, what are like maybe like two or three? Maybe like two or three if you can't pick a favorite, Lorena. I don't see music while working on podcasts. What podcast are you listening to usually, Nate? I'd be curious to hear. We got a good variety in this chat. I love it. Workout by Jake Cole is one of my favorites, too. Yeah, Eminem does have a lot of workout classics. Good call out, Shiloh. There's a good variety in here. I like it. So we're going to give a couple more minutes before we get started, let people join in. We know a lot of people are probably taking a quick break before they jump over after their previous meeting closed. I'm awful with titles, but anything by Skrillex, Five Finger Death Punch. Yeah, those are those are two big ones for sure to kind of bring that adrenaline. Any track by Skrillex or any track by Five Finger Death Punch, I feel like I just want to like break something while I'm listening to it. But I feel like working out maybe is a, a healthier option than breaking things. So if you're just joining, the question at the bottom, what is one song that pumps you up before a workout session? Yes, Lil Wayne, absolutely. People forget like how many hits, hits like that whole crew had in like late 2000s, early 2010s, like him, Drake, Nicki Minaj, they just had like this string of hits that was incredible. Oh, uh, Bedrock, I used to run to that all the time. Yes, where's that one? I missed it. I can make your bed rock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's a fun one. Break stuff by Limp Bizkit. Let's go. Okay, we got a list of podcasts here. Thank you for this, Nate. I, oh, Strength Finder. Nate, you're speaking my love language. Uh, I got certified in, in strengths about five years ago, and it's just been an incredible blessing. I love talking about strengths. And I do like the uh, like putting a podcast or audio book on occasionally for workouts. Sometimes I need that break to not be learning, but it is a great way to learn while I'm, I'm getting healthy as well. We got a thumbs up for uh, Old School by Lil Wayne. You picked a popular one. Madea, Madea, maybe I'm saying that correctly. Sorry if I'm not. All right, I think we're ready to to get started here. I appreciate everybody joining for the first ever 
virtual event for Leaders Lens. And we have an incredible guest, Erica Schneider. Erica, thank you so much for joining today. If we could give her a round of applause in the chat, a thumbs up, just bring in some energy. It would be much appreciated. Erica currently has twins that are 10 weeks old. 10 weeks old, yeah. So she's not sleeping a ton. She also has a cohort she's running um, in addition to her, her job. Um, with Grizzle as head of content, but she still made time to be here. And uh, we really do appreciate it, Erica. So thank you so much. Happy to be here. Always. I also want to make sure we we, uh, we shout out the the uh, sponsors and uh, just feel so blessed to have two companies that really believe in the vision of what Leaders Lens is doing. Um, so first we have Electric. Over 900 companies use Electric to manage services, to level up their IT strategies, reduce operational costs, and free up valuable time, saving time and money. That's a winning combo. Also, Partner Hero, um, they customize and build a team to match your culture, your customer, and your business needs. Then they layer on training tools, customer insights, and more to your operation scales with quality and efficiency. Highly recommend checking out both these companies. They're doing great jobs making the life of a founder easy. And speaking of making a founder's life easier, nothing will make your life easier than effective communication. And we have an expert in Erica here to, to help us guide through this pro guide us through this process. But first, Erica, why does it matter? Like why should leaders even care about being able to communicate effectively? Why is this a big deal? I mean, if you don't communicate effectively, you don't have an open line of communication. It's that simple, right? And open lines of communication are so important in terms of motivation, productivity, you know, trust, um, empowerment, all the all the things that that make teams work well together and actually get shit done. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you aren't communicating effectively, people aren't going to care. They won't know what you want from them, why you want it from them, what their next step is. So communication is everything. Hundred percent. And and chat, I'll encourage you to put questions in the chat. We'll try to get through call them out throughout. But at the end. Can you still hear me? My audio just got a little bit weird. Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. At the end, we're going to call up questions as well. So we'll save some time for, for Q&A. Um, but I think that right now leaders are experiencing additional challenges. And there's more attention needed in keeping the attention of, of, of our employees, especially as we're working in hybrid and re remote environments. Um, so what are, what are some of the additional challenges that you're noticing leaders are facing currently as they, they try to keep their employees engaged? Yeah. So. It's easy to forget to remind people why you're doing something, right? So especially when you're not seeing each other all the time, um, or if you're reducing meetings, which is also a popular trend, which I agree with, but it also means that if you're having written or async communication, um, sometimes you're going to forget these core tenets of like keeping people's attention and keeping them motivated, right? Which is like, again, what I was saying, why, why are we doing what we're doing, right? Like, what's the goal? What's our mission? What's our purpose? Um, you know, why, why are we all working towards this? Why is this thing so important? Um, you know, so it's hard to keep people's attention if you're just like spouting directions all the time, which are disconnected from like the big why, right? A hundred percent. And Gallup's research actually shows this as well. They did they, in their recent polls, they're showing that employees feel more disconnected with the company's mission and purpose than ever before. Um, we had a great trajectory where companies and leaders were doing a much better job and um, employees felt that connection. But over the last two to three years, we've seen a significant drop. How often do you feel like leaders should be communicating the why with their teams? What, and what can that look like? I mean, it's especially important when you're asking for them to do something right so like always coming back to that big why um because it's really easy for people that are just doing all of these tasks to forget you know like why are they asking me to do this um so if you if you don't come back to that that primary reason then people can feel you know confused or frustrated or just like not excited about the task at hand Yes, and I think a challenge for uh, for us as leaders as we hear this is to not think about have I heard this before, but really think about how well am I actually executing on this? 
like when I haven't asked, how consistently am I asking, am I actually discussing the why and why this is important? And yeah. I, I think a great framework that we had kind of talked through it in, in a private is whenever you're making that ask, just make sure you're following up with, this is why this is, this is important. Yeah. Do you have frameworks that you, you generally work with when you're thinking about crafting a message? You've grown your audience on Twitter from zero to like 50,000 over the last six months, which is, which is just phenomenal. I think it's really a testament to how effectively you are communicating your ideas. Yeah. So I follow the what, why, how framework um, for everything that I do. Um, you can also call that the logical reasoning framework, which is like the claim support takeaway. Um, and that's the basis of a, a logical persuasive argument. So if you're going to say, you know, it's important that we do this, um, why? My immediate question is why, right? So that's the next thing you should answer. If you should never say we need to do this. It should always be we need to do this because, right? Because if you miss that link of supporting your claim with some sort of a reason or evidence, then um it leaves room for tons of objections and questions, right? Why, like, why are you asking me to do this? Um, what's the point? And then of course, how do I do this, right? So it's way too easy to say, make sure that you do these 10 things, right? So if you explain why again, or bring it back to the mission at hand, um, then that's gonna get people on the same page. Expectations will be clear. They'll understand why they're doing a thing, what the ultimate outcome is meant to be. And then you don't have to go into like extreme details every time with how, but maybe you have a resource that you can link to, you know, just to remind people, hey, you know, this is how we do things. Um, because it's just, it's very easy for people to kind of, especially in async environments, right, to kind of go off and do their own thing. Um, so I always like to say, you know, try to do this um by this time here's here's again why we're doing this like the client last time had this type of feedback for example um so it's important that we do it this way and then like here's the link to the to the client guidelines again in case you forgot something like that so you support what you're saying support what you're saying i think the other piece um i want to add to that i want to hear you your your ideas on this as well is i feel like sometimes when we do talk about the why we talk about why it's important to us or why it's important to the business Right. But the truth is our audience, they don't really care about what's important to us. They care about what's important to them. What are some tactics you've learned to make sure that, that piece is also included in the in the conversation, especially in a written format? Yeah. So, all right. So when you hire people, right, hopefully you get to know a bit about like why they're excited to be doing the job because everyone's different. So the why is going to be different for everyone. Like not everybody is going to be on the same development path or have the same um, reasons for being excited about doing a thing. So um bring it back to to the reasons why you know that they're excited about doing something so it's not just you know i'm so excited to do this i keep using myself as an example for my content marketing agency right but it's it's less about like i'm excited to do this well because the client you know is craving this and this is an exciting new thing for me and my agency um and it's i can say that if i want but then it's like you know you told me that you were excited about learning how to do strategy you know, become a better strategist, for example. So um, the tasks that we do here are not only going to help the client achieve their goals this way, but it's going to help you learn, you know, the steps that you need to, to not only do a great job for the client, but to, you know, grow um, and in your leadership and development process um, so that you can have those skills, hopefully use them here. But if you don't, you'll have something that you've learned here that you can use elsewhere in your career. Beautiful. I love that. Another thing that you uh, you teach is the importance of being direct. What's what's the value of being direct, and especially when, when we're we're putting a message together? Yeah. So in written communication, it's way too easy to be waffly and redundant. Um, and ram another word for waffly is rambly. Um, I work with a lot of Brits. I don't know if waffle is a British thing. <laughs> but, um, rambling is another way to say it. And so kind of beating around the bush, you know, like saying something and saying it a different way than and saying it a different way. Um, if you remove that redundancy, it's much easier to get your message across, right? And communicate clearly. So um, when you self-edit, which we can talk about at the end um, or anytime throughout this, you want to read to see if you've made any um, repetitions, not just in like the words that you're using, but the ideas that you're saying. Um, and you want to cut that out so that every single sentence 
adds value and says something new. Um, think of content like a slide, right? So you want to get people sort of smoothly from the top to the bottom. And if you have redundancy, if you're repeating your ideas, um, if there's a bunch of words that sound exactly the same, people are going to trip up on that. It's going to cause friction. Um, and it's not going to be as clear and direct, which can lead to questions and objections. So let's, let's, let's build on that idea of thinking content as a slide. Like what are the different slides that we should have as our building blocks? And I'm actually going to make notes here in the, in the chat so we, we can reference it for our visual learners. Yeah. So the way I think of the slide is um, when you're speaking to someone um, at the top of the slide, like the whole point is to get them interested in what you're saying. Right. Um, and then when they put effort into reading it, they're sort of going down the slide. Um, and when they get to the bottom of the slide, they should feel some type of a reward. Like, okay, I understand what I'm meant to do. Like that was clear. Um, the expectations were set. Um, I know how it relates to me. It doesn't feel random, right? Like it feels like it was spoken to me and my needs, which isn't always possible when you're speaking to everyone at once, um, but it should at least be tailored to the room. Um, and so if you have, you know, um, redundancy, you're, it, it's it's not logical in certain places. Um, you're, yeah, not very transparent on what the goals are. It's not tied back to your mission. It can create this friction. And then the metaphor I like to think of is that people get stuck on the slide. Like, you know, when you're going down a slide at a playground, if if you've done that in years, I haven't, but like for some reason, this is my <laughs> metaphor. There's certain shoes um, that like just get stuck on the slide. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you yeah, you just careful. get stuck and you have to like yeah. slide down manually and it yeah. sucks, right? <laughs> so that's how I picture. So is um, there like, it's like a framework that you use that kind of teaches people how to to continue helping the audience move down the slide? There's a bunch of different frameworks and it kind of depends on your content format and what your goal is. Um, so the claim support takeaway is a really good framework. Um, Love it. Then so there's there's a couple so others. Slide, slide one would be claim, slide two support. This is what supports the argument. And then slide three is like, if I'm a leader and I'm setting expectations, here's what I need you to do. You kind of talked about the who's going to do what by when, sort yeah. of a, a focus on that last slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I have other I have other frameworks that I use in content marketing that may or may not apply, but my favorite one is the is SCQA, so situation challenge question answer, right? So you you set the situation, the context up front so everybody's on the same page. Then you present the challenge that you need to overcome, right? Um and then you can ask a question or make a statement so that kind of brings everyone together. How are we going to do this together? Um, and then the answer is your is your synthesis, right? Like this is how I think we should do this. Um, of course, good leaders also have open ended answers where um, if it calls for a conversation, people then feel empowered to share their idea of an answer as well. I love it. And Shiloh has a great call out here in the chat. In my experience, being direct leaves less room for gray area. It lets people know exactly how you feel, what you are observing, and what you expect. And that shows confidence, right? If you can be very direct with, with what it is and what your expectations are, and then also bringing the data points from your observations, that shows a lot of confidence into why this is, is, is important to the Nate ads. Clarity is kind. Who said that? Brene Brown, 100%. Legendary leadership author there. Great call outs in the chat. Thank you all. Exactly. And don't forget, if you have questions or thoughts, feel free to put them in the chat. We want to make sure this is a, a group conversation and that we're touching the things that are, are important to you. We appreciate you investing your time being here. Um, so, so Gallup's research, they show that clarity of expectations is down. People feel less connected uh, to the mission or purpose. Um, let's talk about clarity in writing. What are some elements of writing that will help it be clear? Yeah, so there's like big picture and small picture clarity, right? So when I say that, I mean like big picture is the message as a whole and small picture is the actual like sentences and paragraphs, right? So big picture clarity, like am I speaking to intent, right? Like, am I speaking to something that matters to me and tying it to what matters to the people that are reading it? Like, are we all on the same page? Um, are the outcomes that I want specific? Um, if I'm not specific and I'm general about what I want, then there's room for confusion and those gray areas that we were talking about. Um, if I... Um, if I'm going um, 
sorry, if I, if I, that's the big picture stuff. And then for the small picture stuff, right? So um, sentence structure is a big one. Um, if you're writing and you've got only really long, complex sentences, tons of commas um, that just kind of run on, it's going to, again, add that friction. It's hard to comprehend. It's harder to skim, which a lot of people do, let's be honest, especially when we're reading during a workday. Um, so you want to have varied sentence structure, a mix of shorter, mix of longer to vary it up. Um, you want to include that why behind the what, um, make sure that there's no redundant um, phrases. Um, and then is it clear? Readability is a big one. So um, in content marketing, readability means that you want your content to be able to be digested by the broadest group of people possible. So if you're using tons of complex language um, jargon that maybe not everybody will understand, um, again, it can lead to those like confusing friction points. So um, you want to just make sure that you're speaking as simply without dumbing down your message as possible. That's great. I think uh, especially relevant for leaders as so many employees are transitioning between companies, you might assume that something in your company that is, is jargon is just well known. Um, that can make people feel lost and not included uh, in the conversation. So just making sure that you're clarifying exactly what a certain phrase means uh, is, is absolutely a big deal. Keep it super simple. Absolutely, mm -hmm. Michelle. KISS is a, is a great acronym. And then yeah. Erica, as you are editing your own writing or, or the writing of others, is there a certain process that you use or specific questions that you'll ask about the writing before you're you're hitting publish or hitting that send button? Yeah, I have tons of checklists that I can share if you want um, to then send out to people. That'd be um, awesome. But yeah, um, mainly I'm looking um, again for those developmental big picture or small picture questions. Um, you know, just about the clarity of the writing. And um, if I, something that's kind of hard to explain, but is important to grasp is that what you're saying needs to be like a through line throughout, right? So um, it's always important to tie it back to the main thesis. So you kind of present your thesis at the start, you know, we need to do this because of, of X, Y, and Z. And then everything that you do to support that has to tie back to that. Um, if you move too far away from your thesis, it's going to feel like it's a different piece of writing um, and it's not connected anymore. And again, people will lose that through line. Um, Absolutely. I love yeah. that. And Tony calls out here at the same time, the reader has some responsibility if the jargon is standard to the company. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there is some responsibility on you as a new hire to be, be comfortable asking questions. Um, but, but I also thought at the same time that as a leader, just making sure people feel comfortable because some people will just suffer in silence and you never want somebody feeling that way. You might miss out on helping somebody reach these, reach their potential. But I, I do agree. There's some responsibility on both ends there. And then Michelle did ask to, to please share. So we'll make sure um, that we do share the, 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 uh, the template that you use um, mm -hmm. in the follow-up email that we'll send out. And somebody else asked if this is being recorded. It is being recorded. We'll send out the, uh, the video. So you have a link to that as well in the, the follow-up email. I think we have about three or four day turnaround on that. If I'm correct, Juan Cruz, if you're able to come off mute and just clarify or Tyler, if that's accurate, you're going to be part of this podcast as well. That's yeah, right. Juan, Cruz, Juan Cruz said yes in the chat. So we're good to go there. Awesome. As one people... More template. Sorry, there's one more template. I just remembered. It's, I'll put it in the chat. It's, it's um, bluff, bottom line, up front. And that's another one where um, you say what you mean right away you you get the point across right away so that there's no questions so it's like we need to do this because and then you can explain it um if you bury the lead and bury that bottom line um people might not get to it so i would, I think, I would always start with it up front yeah that's that's the attention grabber and i feel like also um anybody that's familiar with familiar with myers briggs framework uh they they teach that some people are big picture learners and they want to understand the big picture to help before they can see the details. Other people need the details. Um, but I think sometimes if you lead with the details, people that are big picture thinkers or process information that way, it's hard for them to connect how things are are actually connected. Um, so just kind of creating that umbrella of this is what we're talking about can help people then follow through the, the specific steps. And I think the bluff framework is, is a great example of that. 
So bottom line up front, is that is that is that a process to the bluff framework or is that more just saying like just be upfront at the beginning? Yeah, just be upfront at the beginning. So um speak to like answer the question right away. Like the big question on everyone's minds, whatever that is, answer it right away. Love that. And then uh Michelle put in the chat the brain retains information through the law of Ben, beginning, end, and middle. I love that. That's great. This is a great storytelling framework as well. Stories are such a powerful, powerful way to teach. Yeah. When you're when you're working with with writers that are are wanting to be more impactful, wanting wanting to be more clear, appear more confident, where do you usually start? What are some some small changes that you usually see uh, having having a big big impact? Um. So simple, but in school, um, in academia, we often learn to write in the passive voice. Um, and switching it to active voice um, is just much more direct. So by nature, active voice has a known audience, whereas the passive voice, you're speaking to someone or about something that you don't know. So if you change it to active voice, not only is it easier to skim, but it's much more direct um, and easier to comprehend. So that's one of the first things I always do is help them change their writing from passive to active voice. Can you just give an example of? Yeah, how there's a really, that? really elementary example. So um, the ball is kicked by Erica is passive, right? So Erica is the object um, and it's at the end of the sentence. Um, sorry, Erica is the subject and it's at the end of the sentence. You want the subject to be at the start of the sentence. So Erica kicks the ball, right? So um, I'll just write that down. Erica kicks the ball is... Uh, better than the ball is kicked by Erica. So um, generally subject, verb, object is what you want instead of um, the inverse, which is object, uh, verb, subject. And I think a simple way for us to implement that as leaders, especially in delegation, is put the person's name that owns the task, then put the task they're owning. I think I see a lot of checklists and to-do lists that do it the opposite. And it seems like this is a much more, it's, it's a way that we're just used to, it's easier for us to retain information using this process. So that might be a be a small change people can take away from this. 100%. What's a, what's another small change that you feel like gen, most writers have to work through as they, as they develop? Um, so giving examples is another really key one. So when you're explaining how to do something, um, giving an example, either real or hypothetical, can really help drive that point home and help readers make that connection, right? In, in in content marketing, we usually call it the aha moment, right? It's like when the light bulb goes off. Um, and so um, when you say, you know, um, we have an important task coming up, we have to do this. Um, and then because why, here's how, right? So that's the next like what, why, how in the how portion of that framework. Um, give an example of why it's important, um, a way that you've done this in the past that's either worked and um, how it's worked, or it's failed, why it's failed, what you're going to do differently this time. Um, you can pull in like a case study. Um, you can pull in data. Uh, you can, yeah, pull in anything that you want to to really drive that point home and make it super clear. And the better you know your team, the easier it will be to provide the information that will help connect with them. Because some people are going to be money motivated. And so you might tell, explain how this change will help them make more money. Some people are really motivated by relationships, wanting to be there for their peers. So you can kind of talk about how this change will help with that. But they all have the common element of like, let's tell a story. Let's give an example of of how this is going to, going to how this will, will play out. Um, exactly. Yeah. In 2018, you know, we tried this thing. Um, it didn't go well because of this, right? So this year we're going to try it this way because of this. Here's what we're expecting. Here's some obstacles that we might face. Um, but, you know, and then you kind of like take them through this journey. So they're on the same page as you, as opposed to just like, we're trying this thing. Here's why, like go, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like these sort of reminders are, are incredible. That's why I love these sort of group think sessions and having experts like yourself, you know, come on, come on and chat is that I, f- I feel like I know I should be giving examples, but I can think of like two situations these last two weeks of my life 
where it's like, man, that conversation would have been a lot more impactful had I brought in an example to really emphasize the point. So mm -hmm. great reminder. Yeah. And then Michelle asked in the chat um, to chat about the relationship between disc styles and written communication. I'll be honest, Michelle, I'm not really an expert on, on the disc styles. I'm, I'm familiar with the framework, but I, I don't feel like I know it well enough to speak on that, unfortunately. Um, but that might be, a, might be a good follow up. So I appreciate planting that seed for us. But do we have any, any other questions um, from the group? I'd love to have a couple people come off of mute or put them in the chat, but we want to make sure this time is valuable for you. And we're going over the, uh, the information that's going to be most impactful for you in your roles. You kind of a uh, pulse check. Mm. Great. So uh, Kim's conversation, I'll read it out just for the podcast. And then uh, Leo, great question as well. So Kim's question, I have a tendency to write too formally. Tips mm -hmm. to avoid this. Yeah. So personalized content definitely hits home a bit more. So formal content can feel a bit stuffy. Um, so a good way to avoid that is if you're writing in the third person to change it to the first or second. Um, so for example, instead of, you know, the business needs to do, you know, X in revenue this year. Say, you know, we need to do X in revenue this year um, because of this. So um, turn what feels like an entity into a human conversation, if possible, um, because people connect to humans, not businesses, right? So um, yeah, we should do this. Like it's important that you do this instead of like the business needs the team um, to do this, right? So um, you want to imagine that you're that you're writing like you're speaking, um, obviously without the ums and the ahs and all the things that we do sometimes if we speak. But um, you want to write like you're having a conversation rather than, you know, you're writing um, something formal like a contract. That's great. And I feel like this process, there's a lot of unlearning involved because we spend so much time like learning how to write formally. <clears throat> and then we get to the real world and that's not really what connects with people, right? They want just like, they want to just have a conversation. They want to talk to a person. They don't want to talk to a, a manual or an instruction booklet. Um, and Kimberly, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to put it in the chat or if, if that helped. I mean, I'd love to just see a thumbs up or something along those lines. And then um, from Layla, any specific advice for new leaders? That can go in a, a ton of different directions. Uh, Layla, if you give some context maybe on like what what specifically would be most helpful or something you're struggling with, I think that would, would help me make sure I'm, I'm helping you as much as possible. But I think just in general, um, being comfortable admitting you don't have all the answers goes a long ways. I feel like when we get a new leadership role, like our, me our media instinct um, is to like, we want to prove ourselves, we want to come in and make a bunch of changes and make things our own. But what happens is we damage trust when we take that approach. If you just come in and are vulnerable on this is what I'm good at, this is what I'm going to need help with, and make sure your team sees you as a person, we kind of see that constant theme of, of humanizing our, ourselves as leaders, um, see, you as, see you as a person, you'll develop trust, and it'll be more likely to pull the best ideas out of your team. Really, I think maybe a way to summarize that is focus less on being impressive and focus more on being impressed and understanding the strengths of the people on your team. So I feel like new leaders, that's advice that sometimes people struggle with, depending. Um, here's, here's a good one from Tony. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, Erica. I'm very short and, and direct coming across as rude. Um, then we had a few other people kind of chime in that say that like when giving feedback, you know, they, they love some some ideas and how they can be direct and confident. but not come across as, as rude or condescending. Yeah. So um, CEOs especially have this tendency to write these really like short emails that are just like, you know, <laughs> uh, I need this done now. Right. Um, I, that always definitely, that, that always to me comes across as a little bit too direct. Right. And so I think as leaders, we can tend to forget that even though we're incredibly busy, there is someone on the other end of this, um, that wants to feel like they're, um, speaking to a human and not someone that is too busy to care 
So that's where that conversational, like back and forth mantra comes in. Um, you want to be short and direct, um, but you also want to be open and empathetic and it's kind of a fine line. Um, so when it comes to writing skills, I mean, being short and direct is probably the best way to go in terms of written communication. Um, but maybe just say a bit more and keep it open-ended. Um, I didn't see the, the feedback example, but when I'm giving feedback to writers, for example, instead of leaving a comment in a Google doc saying, you know, um, fix this or, you know, expand on this. I'll say again, expand on this because, and I won't say that every time, but the first time that I leave a comment, I'll say, we need to expand on this because, and then maybe I'll say, you know, it's important to the client that we do this, this, and this. So what, if we expand on it this way, we'll make sure that we're hitting the mark. And then because I've, ex I've taken the time to explain myself um, in a short and direct way, but sort of like in a way that is taking into account that there's someone on the other end, I can, I've been given myself um, the leeway to go through the rest of the draft and be like, okay, we need to expand this, expand that, like be more direct here. So set the example once, um, and then you can sort of like go through it faster. I love it. The only thing I'd add to that is also, I think, make sure you're picking the right medium for the message. And if it is a hard conversation, like maybe text or like putting in a short message in Slack, or if you're providing somebody feedback and they're new to the team, you don't really have that rapport built yet, it might be better just to jump on the phone so they can hear your tone. They can tell that you're coming from a caring place um, with the feedback. I think sometimes it's, it's good to err on that side um, as opposed to sending a message and just assuming that they get it. They understand this is just feedback and I'm just trying to help them out um, because some, sometimes they won't get it right. And until you have that relationship formed, it can be good, I think, just to err on the other side and make sure that the person really understands that you're giving feedback because you want them to be better. And it's not a personal attack, it's just a tool that you're using to help their development. So yeah. let's see what else we got. We have some great questions here. Yeah, this is really great in the chat. And then Layla, uh, delegation, awesome. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit, Erica? Do you feel like that's like how, to, how to delegate or things that you would you would use? I think that you touched on a lot of it in the clarity piece, maybe emphasizing some of those points. Yeah. So when it comes to delegation, um, I always try to um, do something myself once and like set an example. And then anything that I do, like processes, SLAs, guidelines, I will make a resource hub um, that is incredibly easy for my team to find because I don't want them to always have to come to me with questions. Like I don't have time to answer the same question over and over again. So if you document your processes um, from the start, I think that's something that as leaders, we often forget to do because we're just so busy. And then by the time we need to delegate, we don't have time to do this, right? So if you're lucky enough to be a new leader at the moment, document everything now, um, that is something that is huge. So if you document it um, and then you have a link to it, right? And you post that link, maybe you pin it to a Slack channel or whatever your, you know, chosen medium is. And then you can always just like link to it. Um, and that's a way to say like, Hey, you know, I, I've gone through this before, like check it out. If you have any follow-up questions, let me know. Right. So you're just directing them to some, to like yourself in a different venue. And speaking of creating processes, that's actually what next week's session is all about. So we'll make sure we, uh, we post a link in the chat. We'd love to, to see some of, the, of you there as well. Um, the only thing I'd add to that piece on the uh, <laughs> of the delegation, Layla, is um, being specific on who's going to do what by when. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like sometimes it's easy to fall into a trap of like, hey, this thing needs to be done, team. And then assuming they're going to figure out who's going to do it. And, it. and one or two things is going to happen. It's going to be the same person that signs up for everything and they're going to always be doing the work. And then they're going to get resentful of their team and you know, trust kind of breaks at that point. Um, or nobody's going to do it. They're all going to expect somebody else to get it done. So I think when you have a task, just make sure that there's clarity around who's going to actually own this task and when you're expected it to be done. So you don't need something done on Wednesday, Thursday comes around and you ask, you know, where is this? And then they're like, well, I was going to do that tomorrow. And it's like, let's be clear on who's going to do it when they're going to get it done ahead of time. It's going to set yourself up for success and save yourself um, from having to, to have hard conversations. Mm -hmm. 
trying to skim through this. I appreciate all the engagement in the chat. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, does anyone have a people and culture survey to get honest feedback on what employees are feeling in the environment? Yeah, I like Nate's callouts of the uh, Gallup's Q12. Um, another, like just a simplified version um, is what a keep, start, stop. So asking your team, it can be in individuals, it can be you know in a group ses session, you can even set it as a, as a survey. But what's something that we're doing we should keep doing? What's something we should stop doing? And what's something we should start doing? Um, this sort of an activity or... Um, will really help provide clarity in what's working so you can keep doing the things that are working, but also give your, your team a chance to uh, make recommendations on, on changes that will go a long ways. And generally, they'll, they'll, they'll find the obstacles for you if you'll listen. They'll be, they'll be able to blah, 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 blah. They'll be willing to share what's getting in their way. This is awesome. And thank you, Juan Cruz, for posting that link in the, uh, in the chat for next week's survey. And Shiloh, when it's everyone's responsibility, it becomes no one's responsibility. I've actually not heard that quote, but that is exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, Lorena, I'm in learning and development, and I document how I create trainings and programs so whoever takes over um, for me can go in and make changes and updates and trainings instead of starting all over again. Yes. Way to simplify. Way to be thinking about your legacy there as well and like how is this thing going to carry forward when, when you leave. So awesome. And I'm sure your organization appreciates that a ton, Lorena. That's going through. This group is so awesome. Thank you all for being here. Um, so, Nate, one thing I've learned from deep dive into Clifton Strengths is that we all have needs and contributions. When we introduce our contributions, directness, et cetera, before they introduce themselves, it helps to set the tone expectations with other parties. Yeah, 100%. We think about getting vulnerable um, as leaders. It really sets the tone. Like, here, this is a place you can be okay. You don't have to hide your gaps. You don't have to hide your mistakes when things happen. We'll talk about them. We'll work through them. And, you know, nobody's as smart as everybody. So if you can bring out the best ideas from the team, that's really how you're going to be able to move your organization forward. Great call out, Nate. Thanks for that. If we missed a question, feel free to repost it. I'm kind of scrolling through and I'm hoping we're, we're getting anything. But I definitely don't want somebody to feel like we're ignoring them. Um, here's a good question about um, this person asked to remain anonymous. So I won't, won't say their name. But uh, dealing with a supervisor, and you feel like you're not getting getting support, Eric. Have you seen good tactics in communicating with that that supervisor? Where you're, you're coaching up can be a little bit uncomfortable because you don't really know how they're going to respond. And but if you're not getting what, what you need from that supervisor, do you have any 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 best practices or tactics that have worked for you well there? Um, it's a hard one. Um. That is a very hard one. It, it's very context depending. Um, so usually I, I'll i start with like, you can start by stating the situation as you see it, right? So um, I, I'm interpreting this as that, or I'm experiencing this in this way. And then you ask a question, right? Um, how are you? experiencing this do you feel like my assessment is accurate or do you feel like there's something different going on so um one of my favorite things to do is to state what i think is going on and then ask you know do you agree do you disagree how do you feel because then you're presenting instead of just being like you know i feel this way like and it's frustrating you're opening up the conversation um and you're sort of like helping get those defenses down um so yeah, state how you feel and then ask if they feel the same way. Like I'm feeling like there could be some some issues here, but I'm not, you know, not entirely sure if we're on the same page. Like here's what I'm noticing. What are you what are you noticing? Yes, you I love you work through this. Love that framing. Thanks for the question as well. Um, any tips for motivating and encouraging those on our team who are not self-starters or have more rebellious tendencies? Um, I think here it starts with just assuming the best intentions. Like, I truly believe nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm just going to go be terrible at my job today. Like, it's a very rare situation if that happens at all. But the reality is, like, people are complex. There's a lot of things that go into our lives. Um, and I think the the key for somebody that we feel like is lazy or just you know, isn't motivated is just taking time to be curious and really understand what's happening in this person's life. And coming into that conversation, assuming that this person is trying their best, like right? they're trying their best, but there's just something getting in the way. 
and coming across as that leader that's there to like try to help figure out what is this thing that's getting in your way? How do we make this a better situation for you? Um, which, which can be challenging because as a leader, you probably have pretty ambitious goals for yourself. You're trying to hit your, your Q1 goals or, your, or whatever it might be. And you have this person that's just not carrying their weight. Um, so it can be challenging to assume the best intentions of that person when you wish they would just wake up and get the job done. But just taking that time to really listen and understand them will, one, show that you're somebody there that supports them, that cares about them at a deeper level than just this person that's going to complete these tasks for my team. Um, but it shows that you're invested in them. And and uh, I've had success with that approach. I feel like just assuming the best intentions, coming to the conversation, curious, wanting to learn what the obstacles are so you can help support them in, in overcoming them. So great question there. That is a tricky one for sure. Yeah. Um, and then Leila I, has it. Oh, go for it. Sorry. No, I was going to say, I'm just going to give an anecdote. I just had, I have 10 week old twins and um, the, the founder and CEO of the agency where I'm the head of content um, kind of had a check-in with me the other day. And, and he just goes, you know, how are you feeling? Are you still excited about everything? And from that question, I, I could tell that he noticed that I am just very checked out. Um, and so I reassured him, like, I'm still excited, but, you know, I'm not sleeping. And so I'm, I'm excited about the job just as I ever was, but I'm just not able to communicate it in the same way. Um, and then he said, you know, great, you know, that's all I needed to know. As long I'm still getting my job done, but it was an important check in so that he knew that I was still excited about what I was doing. And I appreciated that he checked in as well. Yeah, it's just having somebody that notices sometimes means yeah. means the world, especially right now when people are working from home, you're kind of, you can feel pretty isolated. And if something seems off, just like taking that time to reach out and like, hey, I noticed you know, your, your energy is a little different today. Is everything okay? Can, can go a long ways. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of great comments in the chat I wanted to call out. Michelle, assume noble intent until proven otherwise. Love that. Uh, Layla asked questions. I found out one of my direct reports hated her job. Luckily, we had an opportunity to change her role and she is thriving. What an incredible success story that started just by taking the time to listen. I'll share another example. I was working with a leader that had an employee that was just running late to meetings um, constantly. And she's like, I don't know what it is. I'm going like to have to fire her. It had got to that point. So I talked to the employee and what it, she, um, she was in a situation where people would just come into her office and ask her for help unexpectedly. And she just didn't know how to say no. She felt like it was rude to pull up her phone out to check the time when um, there was, when somebody was talking to her, she, she wanted to be fully engaged in the conversation, which I think is an awesome attribute. And she said, I wish I had a clock in here. Like it's something as simple as that. Like I wish there was a clock in here. So I just knew what time it was when somebody came into my office. And sometimes it's like these simple things that can fix big issues. But if we don't take the time to understand, we, we can potentially miss it. Mm. So awesome, awesome questions here. Anything that, um, Erica, you want to add? We're coming close to the hour. This time has absolutely flown by. And yeah. I really appreciate you, Erica, for sharing so much wisdom, but also for everybody that joined the call and was so engaged in this conversation. This has been... I was a little nervous before the first session. I'm not going to lie. You know, it was the first one, but um, I mean, the, the engagement from the group really helped out. So thank you all for, for making this an enjoyable experience. But Eric, anything you want to add as we, we come to the wrap the conclusion here? Yeah, um, I'm just pulling up. I just pulled up some editing exercises that I go through with my writers because I wanted to circle back to that really yes. important question earlier about, you know, how do you make sure that when you are self-editing your your words that you're being as, you know, smooth and friction free as possible. Um, and one of the other things besides active passive to active voice is to practice cutting the fluff. Um, so here's an example of a, what I would consider a fluffy sentence and how I cut it. So uh, the most tried and true way to discover exactly where our customers consume information is by talking to them. Um, and the way that you can cut the fluff out of that sentence to say, just by simply saying, to learn where our audience or customers consumes information, talk to them. Consumes information, talk to them, right? So the most tried and true way to discover exactly where, whereas you can just say to learn where our audience consumes information. So there's these like phrases that we kind of get stuck into that we can just simplify and cut down and cut out that fluff and filler so that it's just a smoother, quicker read, um, which makes it easier to digest. Beautiful, beautiful. And the um, 
So we'll share the link in the follow-up notes. Is there a link you want to put in the chat? Or what's the best way to do that, do you think? Um, I'm going to make a public version of this because this okay. we're looking at is private. Perfect. Definitely share it. Awesome. So I'll make sure everybody knew what to expect there. But yeah, that's going to be awesome. I know I will absolutely be taking advantage of that. Writing is one of the things I really want to become great at. So any resource at my uh, availability, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using. Mm-hmm. I do want to thank our uh, sponsors one more time, um, both Electric and Partner Hero. I appreciate you both so much for believing in the, the vision of Leaders Lens and, and supporting what we're doing here. Um, if you're in this group, I would love for you to tag myself and Erica with one takeaway that you got from today's session, either on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, I mean, I'll follow anybody that tags me in a post on, on either one. I'd love to connect with you and, and learn more about what, what you're doing. And if there's anything we can be doing to support you, I mean, feel free to shoot me a DM, shoot me an email. Um, I'll always help how I can. And I'm just excited for this Leaders Lens journey in 2023. We have some really fun things in store, and I can't wait to, to share some of it in the near future. But I'll hang out for a little bit if anybody wants to add any uh, or has any specific questions. But otherwise, now's a good time to drop. I appreciate you for being here. I look forward to seeing the takeaways on Twitter or LinkedIn. Be sure to tag, tag us in it so we see it and we can follow you. Enjoy your day, my friends. Enjoy your day. Thank <laughs> you.